Affairs of the Idaho Forest Group, and then followed by Jeff Whitney, who's the Arizona State Forester, Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management, followed by Christine Daw, who's the Director of Renewable Resource Management for the U.S. Forest Service, and then Christy Masco, and if I pronounce that wrong, Christy, I apologize, Executive Director, Sustainable Rangelands Roundtable. So with that, Bob, the floor is yours, and, and feel free to either come up or sit, whatever you'd like to do. Well, th thank you very much. Uh, great to be here. A uh, little context of Idaho Forest Group. Uh, we own six sawmills in uh, northern Idaho, western Montana. Thousand employees, a billion, that's a billion board feet of lumber production, top 10 lumber producer in uh, North America. And we also manage about 52,000 acres of our own timberland. So when a fire starts on uh, federal land that has a uh, hasn't been managed and spreads onto our land. We know something about cross-boundary relationships. Uh, what, what I want to talk about is uh, increasing pace and scale, and um, and how that fits in with landscape level um, planning. Uh, the important part on, on this slide is there's 8.8 .8 million acres in Idaho that's at risk of fires or overstocking or, or something like that. So that's why we think we need to increase pace and scale. You can't keep going at it a few hundred acres or a few thousand acres at a time. The, um, this just shows the risk of, of mortality and the, and the red areas are the areas that are at risk. And you can see from the map that, that Idaho and western Montana, 28% uh, and 21% of the tree forested acres are at risk of insect and disease, fires, stuff like that. So uh, th this slide just talks a little bit about all the tools that are available to the Forest Service primarily. Uh, the only thing I want to highlight is we need to use all of the tools, um, all of the tools in the tool chest, uh, good neighbor authority being one of them. Uh, Idaho is actually leading the way in good neighbor authority. Uh, we have, there's 11 projects scattered throughout the state. Uh, three of them have actually been sold. The three that have been sold are going to generate uh, $4.5 million in program income. What program income is, 20% of it goes back to the state of Idaho to cover their costs. 40% can go to other, other land restoration projects throughout the forest. And the final 40% would go to planning the next project so that we can do additional work on the ground. Uh, this, the next piece is a little bit on technology. Um, I, I think the, in the next five years, technology is going to change how timber sales are laid out, monitored, and managed. Um, we not only have a, a multi-spectrum satellite, we have drones, we have LIDAR. The, not that this is going to replace boots on the ground, but I think it's going to make boots on the ground um, more effective and more efficient. So this is just a drone footage showing, you know, how we can use drones to do an overview of a fire, or it could be just a forested landscape that's uh, impacted by insect and disease. Um, so that when we do our collaboration, we're collaborating on, on the really the areas that need some additional work and, you know, the ones that follow the general guideline, we shouldn't be spending a lot of time on that. So we, we think better data through technology is going to actually lead to, to better sales and, and better results on the ground. And it can also be used to monitor on the ground to see if the intent of the project is actually being accomplished. Um, and then drones are useful not only for aquatics, but wildlife, uh, road locations, in insect and disease outbreaks. Um, all of this stuff, pre and post fire and pre and post management, it's, it's a great opportunity, I think, just to become more effective and efficient. 
So the, on the pace and scale, uh, I think everybody knows like fif usually 15 to 40 percent of a forest is uh, in the suitable timber base. And commonly projects now are between 5 and 15 percent of the land that actually gets looked at gets treated. So that, that's really not moving the needle. So that's sort of the point of my whole discussion here. Is that uh, this is an example on the Idaho Panhandle where they looked at 42,000 acres uh, and they decided to treat about 6,000. So that's about 15% of the project area. So we think not only do we need to do landscape level planning, but we also need to treat instead of five to 10%, maybe 40 to 50 percent or whatever the amount of land that needs to be treated should be treated. Um, so with that, I'll close and thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's really nice to be here with uh, Western Governors at the Working uh, Lands Forum. So my name is Jeff Whitney. I'm currently the state forester in Arizona. We've got some interesting um, uh, sort of numbers uh, about Arizona. For all intents and purposes, we don't really have any industry in, in Arizona. We've probably got somewhere around 25 million acres of forested ground. Most of that that's operable is either tribal or national forest system lands. I'm responsible for about 30% of the state in terms of fire suppression and prevention, and that includes 40% uh, of that 22 and a half million acres is uh, 9.2 million acres of state trust land for uh, 13 beneficiaries, all schools, primarily K-12, and uh, then unincorporated private. And, uh, you know, Arizona is a land of contrast. There's a lot of diversity there. So the uh, merchantable timber that we've got is in fairly poor condition. It historically was over harvested. Industry uh, left about the time the spotted owl showed up. And uh, at this point, we're desperately trying to get industry back to Arizona. We do have a little thing out there called Four Fry, which is the Four Forest Restoration Initiative. Pretty remarkable little exercise because we had um, about 30... Um, stakeholders get around an opportunity and they did an EIS for about 2.4 million acres of forest management. But as Bob mentioned, and thank you for that, Bob, um, a, a relatively small percentage of that overall landscape is really what they're talking about. So um, rather than um, looking at opportunities similar to some of the other Western states, um, we've got a high population, we have seven million people, probably five million of the seven live in a metropolitan setting. Our rural counties are desperately depressed. We don't have any industry. And uh, we are gonna talk about cross-boundary conservation and, and um, cross-boundary forest and rangeland management. I was a range con for about 15 years. I did work for the Forest Service for about 25 years, and I worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for 12 years. So, um, all of the things that uh, the previous panel said were, were very, very good and nice to hear. It's good to see Bob Roshide, uh, another fellow Arizonan who apparently has done far better than I, but um, Bob, well done. So I'm gonna step down here so we can see the slides because I, otherwise I could ramble, but I do want to, um, the, um, the power of this little thing, there's a, there's a webinar that you'll be able to see here shortly. And so this is basically a pretty quick rundown on a lot of the different kinds of cross-boundary partnering that we are doing in Arizona today. It is about collaboration. It is about partnerships. So I'm going to take a chance. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Thank you, thank you very much. So, we really embrace the idea of the power of partnerships in Arizona. We couldn't do it um, without, who do I point this at? Okay, so Arizona is an interesting mix of uh, jurisdictions. The uh, yellow are tribal grounds, a uh, couple of the largest reservations in the country, Navajo and Tone Odom. We've also got uh, several Apache 
reservations, White Mountain Apache, which has a, a very vibrant forest industries and, and a pretty healthy stand because of their, their uh, cultural land management practices unfettered by some of the uh, regulations that we've been um, threading our way through the last few decades. But we also have six national forests. The blue and the white on the map are the, the lands that I'm responsible for, but you can see that uh, much of that is either in holdings on private land with willing landowners. We do have a stewardship program. But we, um, we've got a lot of socioeconomic diversity, but primarily it's in the uh, metropolitan area. Our rural, our rural counties are, um, as I mentioned, quite depressed. But um, partnerships are everything. And that um, sort of mantle of a spirit of cooperation, collaboration is, is critical to make that happen. If you could advance the slide, please. Thank you. So there's too many words on there, but we do leverage a lot of different things, a lot of different ways. I've got an extremely modest budget com uh, considering the, the uh, statutory challenges that I've been uh, provided by the legislature. And uh, we do have a lot of larger efforts that do include uh, the Arizona Conservation Partnership. Oh, we can go back. Um, so. Um, the Arizona Conservation Partnership is basically all the state and federal agencies. We, uh, we had a meeting earlier this week. We're about this close to signing a charter. We've been about this close, except for one of the members is not feeling quite as collaborative as we'd like. So could you, could you go back just a couple slides, please? There you go. I mentioned the Four Forest Restoration Initiative. Our issue is that uh, NEPA isn't our problem. We don't have industry. We don't have uh, the supply chain to get the pace and scale going. And uh, it's a bit of a heavy lift. And uh, you know, it's, it's challenging when you've got a single species, small diameter, low value. Uh, we feel like we've got a pretty reputable wood basket, but, and we feel like we've got uh, markets. Uh, we certainly have some of the infrastructure to get that material to markets. But it's hard to get venture capital and demonstrate, you know, have people put in a, a wood industry campus and demonstrate to a willing lender that there's some kind of a return on their investment. Um, we've, we've got a number of other national programs in play, Two Chiefs in the Prescott Basin, which is a Two Chiefs uh, program, a project is a U.S. Forest Service and the Chief of the Natural, natural Resource Conservation Service. Good neighbor authority. Um, we're starting down that road. I signed that agreement with the regional forester two years ago, and we're about to, to uh, implement uh, setting up a couple of our, of our uh, uh, crews to basically do what Bob just suggested, which is dramatically expedite the way that forest timber projects, I'm not saying sales because it doesn't have a lot of value, but there are some incredibly uh, promising opportunities on the horizon in terms of technology and the way that, uh, you know, if it doesn't have value, the current regs uh, don't really apply. And so what we're looking for is ways to rein reinsert some resilience into that landscape. Uh, we do have an exciting program that we've partnered up with NRCS on, and it's, uh, it's a shared process where we've, we've got uh, four shared positions. Uh, we write the plan with willing landowners, and we do forest restoration across the state, and uh, NRCS brings their equip funding to the, to, the, to the opportunity. Tomorrow we're going to talk a little bit about the Flagstaff Watershed Protection Project, and we also have a little thing called the Sentinel Land, uh, Fort Huachuca Sentinel Landscape, which was three federal secretaries, DOD, DOI, for, and uh, uh, Department of Ag, uh, and a number of other players in about a 1.3 million acre footprint down in central southern Arizona around Fort Huachuca to kind of prov provide some protection for that electromagnetic net that they need so that they can provide for our national security. Next slide. Thank you. So uh, we've got a couple of examples here, uh, some of our NRCS pro uh, funded programs on private land. They're relatively modest, but you know, most of our uh, in holdings are fairly uh, small sized. We don't have the kind of landscape that Idaho, as an example, have, which is, you know, 25% uh, federal, 25% tribal, 25% large landowner, 25% small landowner, and a lot of trees. Uh, we've got most of it tied up in national forest system lands. Next slide. Uh, so we are working well. Uh, we feel probably, you know, one of the best examples and model is um, the, the role and relationship that uh, we provide along with our federal partner, NRCS, and willing landowners. So 
I don't think there's really much left. And I don't want to take any more time. And while I'm walking back, John, I, we're going to have to have a conversation about ecosystem management. I did that for a few years. I think we ought to bring it back. It might be a part of our so solution. But thank you, Christine. I don't think I'm going to walk around. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. I've been fortunate enough to be involved in the Forest and Range Land Management Initiative under Governor Bullock's chairmanship since the beginning and was really lucky enough to be the Forest Service liaison to his office for this effort. So um, I have learned a lot um, from the folks who participated, and I think we've made a lot of progress, and there's still a lot more to do. So. Um, coming from the Forest Service, it'd be really easy for me to stand up here and talk about things like um, fire and how we protect at-risk communities, uh, recovery of species, invasive species, or watershed restoration, all that has to do with landscape scale work, restoration, or cross-boundary partnerships. Um, but I thought I'd talk a little bit about something a little different, um, something I've been thinking a lot about just because of the nature of our work and the situation we find ourselves in in terms of capacity and resources, which really forces us to look at different ways of getting work done. And so for me, that the intersection of landscape scale work and cross boundary partnerships, it's really, it's becoming harder and harder for us to separate. Um, you know, Jim Augsbury, when he kicked off the meeting, talked about landscape means different things to different people, depending on what you're talking about and where you are and what your issue is, and that, um, if we're not all talking on with the same language, it's hard to know if we're even understanding each other. Um, I don't think it's something you can nail down and define, but I do think that maybe there's an opportunity to create a frame around it so that we do all understand what we're talking about when we're talking about landscape scale, whether it's conservation of sage grouse across 11 states or whether it's a, a small watershed that provides a water supply for a local community. Um, but it, and some, it was that Jim M. said something about the human landscape um, earlier in his comments. And I've been thinking about this in terms of both ecological, social, and economic landscapes. And with the natural resource challenges that we have today, it's not very often that all three, the, three of those things don't intersect in any one of these issues that we're trying to solve problems around. Like I said, whether it's just one local community or the range of conservation for a, a wide-ranging species. Um, and, and from the Forest Service's standpoint, and our responsibility to steward the public lands so that we provide the, the goods and services the public expects, we can't just talk about an ecological landscape. Um, a lot of our successes have come from collaborative efforts that have grown out of place-based issues or place-based passion or a place-based uh, resource issue that communities connect with, depend on for their livelihood um, and their, their economic value in their communities and places where they recreate and, and expect to go ha have fun on. Um, and so I think it's, you really need to look at it through all three of those lenses in most cases when it comes to natural resource problems. And these, aren't, these problems aren't getting any easier to solve. Actually, I would say they're getting probably more complicated. Um, and so, you know, the, the nature of those challenges and the variety of scales that they can, occur, they can occur at, it's really about, you know, saying to effectively address this, this issue of challenge X, this, land, this is the landscape at which it needs to be dealt with. And that's going to be all over the board depending on what your, what your issue and challenges you're trying to resolve. So I think it's important to just, you know, that's the kind of frame I've been thinking about it in. It has to be flexible. It can't be one size fits all. Um, and the nature of those challenges facilitate cross-boundary partnerships, particularly in our case, and I think in many federal land agencies' cases, we have checkerboard land where we might have intermingled state and private and other types of tribal lands, and the, most of these issues don't, like someone like Noreen said earlier, there's no, you know, boundary recognized by invasive species or fire or water. None of those things stop at fence lines, so... Um, we really need to be thinking about them in terms of cross-boundary partnership. Um, I don't want to talk a whole lot because I want to have some time for questions, but 
I'll just leave you with, with two final things. I think, I think the social nature of human beings in general provides us with an enormous advantage for problem solving. And we'd be really foolish not to take advantage of that. <laughs> um, and, and two, and many of you have heard me say this before, um, we are always going to accomplish more working together than we are separately. But not only will we accomplish more, we will have better outcomes for both our natural resources and our people. With that, I'll pass it on to Christy. Thank you all for letting me talk with you today um, about some of the work that the Sustainable Rangelands Roundtable has done. Um, I'm Christy Masco, the Executive Director. You said that perfectly. There's a prize for that. It doesn't happen often. Um, so first I wanted to introduce the Roundtable because I realized that maybe not everybody is familiar. There we go. Um, so we began as a collaborative partnership process 17 years ago. Um, I was asked yesterday if we're a producer organization. The answer to that is yes. We are a producer organization. We are an academic organization. We have professional society members and we partner with government agencies, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, Natural Resource Conservation Service, NIFA, ERS, um, I'm running out of acronyms. Um, we've met all around the country, so while we're headquartered at the University of Wyoming, um, the roundtable has been a national effort, and I'll briefly go through some of the projects and then highlight three of those. Um, so this is kind of a timeline. We began looking at monitoring and assessment. What information do you need to be able to talk about rangeland sustainability, the social, ecological, and economic aspects? And could the group come together and agree on what we should measure, how we should measure it? And so that process took about two years, um, a diverse array of interests and a diverse array of metrics were developed. And there were 64 different indicators, which made everybody take a big step back and say, we're not gonna monitor 64 things ever. Um, it was more of a toolbox. We transitioned from what do you measure to why do you measure? What are the issues that matter? So food security, climate change, energy development and those trade-offs, ecosystem services that come from rangeland systems. And um, what I'll do now to highlight um, some of the partnership successes, challenges, opportunities, and some of the trade-offs that we've made as we've pursued these projects to inform rangeland sustainability. Um, so the Oregon Multi-Agency Pilot Project came about, um, gosh, I think 2007, they started collecting data on this. This was a culmination of the roundtable's efforts to motivate the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and Natural Resource Conservation Service to come up with a way to talk about rangeland data cohesively, coast to coast, border to border. So they have monitoring platforms in place to do this, right? Forest Service has the forest inventory and analysis, Natural Resource Conservation Service has their national resource inventory, but they had never tried to make those two systems talk to each other to present a cohesive picture of rangelands. And so this project in Central Oregon was the first effort to do that. So 13 counties, 30 million acres, um, Forest Service deployed their FIA platform, NRCS collected NRI, and BLM lands at that point did not have data collected at a national scale. So Forest Service and BLM, or I mean Forest Service and NRCS split the BLM lands. Part of it was FIA, part of it was NRI. The cool thing that came out of this was, yes, we can collect this data. Yes, we can analyze it jointly. And they came out with a um, general technical report in 2014 that highlights the outcomes of that. So the win is that the information is available to do this kind of thing when it's collected. Each platform had to shift a little to allow for that analysis. So it's great that it works. It would be even better if we could do it in more places than 13 counties in Central Oregon. Um, so that's kind of the success and the challenge with that one. 
I think there are rumblings that they may be interested in going back out and revisiting those sample points such that we would then be able to look at trend information to talk about how rangeland condition in that area is changing. Um, the next project deals with economics. So looking at the Sage Grouse Initiative, the practices that they're recommending for ranchers to conserve sage grouse habitat, um, so prescribed grazing and brush removal. The challenge that was brought to us was, can we quantify economically what that means for ranchers? When they're asked to put these practices in, what does this mean for their bottom line? Is it true that it's good for the bird, good for the herd? And if it's true, how true is it in dollars and cents? Um, the exciting part of this project in terms of scale was that as we developed it, we looked at whether it made sense to do this at a state level, to do it at an eco-region level, or whether we wanted to do it using MLRAs, so major land resource areas. Um, and as we worked through this with NRCS, they said we want the best information we can get, we want MLRAs. They also said, we don't just want to look at private lands. We want to look at what this means for public lands ranchers. So this project covers that private public spectrum and will also, um, I think, serve as an example for what we can do in other situations where incentives are being offered to ranchers to change the way they're managing. And how do those incentives really affect the rancher's bottom line? I think when we wrap this project up, um, we'll be able to use this as a framework for other questions. And really quickly, the last project I'll talk about um, was a series of surveys that we did. Um, so we worked with Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, and the Public Lands Council to survey public lands ranchers to develop at a national scale a socioeconomic profile of these ranchers. So what are their characteristics? What are the different types of ranchers? What are the income sources? And then um, Wyoming provided additional funding to get that information for them at a state level. At the same time, we worked with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association to look at ecosystem goods and services that ranchers are providing as they go about their primary business of producing red meat. Um, so this just gives you an idea of the different scales that these surveys went out at. Um, there was discussion of trying to get this information down at a forest district level. And that was cost prohibitive. So that was kind of one of the trade-offs. You know, on the Sage Grouse Economics Project, we were able to do the Cadillac version of the project. We were able to go for MLRAs. We were able to cover public-private. Um, on these surveys, you know, they inform the NEPA analysis by providing that social and economic information, but because it was national in scope at a very general level. And I think more of that sort of work to figure out how changes in management are manifested in rural communities is probably necessary. I think it would be interesting to maybe go the next step beyond these surveys and look at regional economic impacts that are being provided by these resource dependent communities. So hopefully that wasn't too much more than five minutes. I will leave it there. So we have some time here for some questions. Uh, one thing Christine mentioned that I just put two and two together is last year, uh, Governor Bullock keynoted an Andrus conference why public lands matter, probably the last thing Cease did before he passed away later. But he suggested it would be great if the feds would embed somebody at the state level to understand those issues, and that was you, Christine. Good first choice of the governor. Something maybe other governors want to think about doing in terms of building relationships. So, some questions we have. Um, on the things you folks have all dealt with, 
How large does a project have to be before it's considered landscape scale? Is this one of those terms that's a little loosey-goosey? Do we need to define it? How large does it need to be? And just anyone take, take, take a shot at it or not. <laughs> so we had a very long conversation about that this morning. Uh, and? Uh, there were a lot of different perspectives in the room, yeah. which is always a good thing. Um, you know, I think as I talked about, it really depends on the challenge you have in front of you. And it's, it's not, you can't just set an acre, say something, if, if it's over so many acres, it's landscape. Because that's not, none of our systems are, you know, in a box like that. <laughs> uh, n not socially or economically or ecologically. And so I think there has to be a flexible interpretation about what landscape means. As I mentioned, it could be a small watershed that provides a municipal water supply to a community, or it could be the 11 states that cover the sage-grouse habitat across the West. Great. Yeah, I, I guess I would just say it needs to be the level that the Forest Service thinks it needs to be so that they can fully implement their plan. <laughs> Good one. Anybody uh, else? Th thanks, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was, I, I was looking at the topic and I was looking at the speakers, and it's nice that there's another range person at the table. But, uh, you know, for about 15 years, I was a range conservationist for the Forest Service, primarily in Southwest on four different forests. So maybe a landscape is a ranch. Um, you know, if good, if good fences make good neighbors, um, there's not a lot of cross-boundary work except for when you have to go over and gather your cows back uh, when the fence is down in the back 40. But um, what about watersheds? What about uh, aquatics? You know, the last group talked quite a bit, and obviously the focus was on sage grouse, which we, we understand and appreciate why, but, but you know, if you think about ri riverine systems, uh, you know, it, 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 it's going to take any number of shapes, and I think scalability is probably the, the critical opportunity there. So it's been observed um, here that sometimes smaller projects that have a lot of cross-boundary partners are more complex than a large landscape project with maybe just one manager or so. What, um, any insights on that in terms of how we think through landscape stale collaboration, in terms of what ec people's expectations might be as they go into it? Is that, is that important at all to, to pay attention to that, that, that scale may or may not be easier depending on who the players are? Well, I'll, I'm going to go first on that one, yeah. if you all don't mind. Um, you know, I, I, I do think it, um, you know, the closer you look, the more you see. But um, maybe the, um, the more important factor is uh, the willingness to collaborate. There we go. Uh, you know, it, uh, if, um, you know, there, there's a, a lot of people, people bring issues to the table. Larger landscapes, you kind of blend some of that out. When you get local, you get serious and real pretty quick. That, that actually um, is good, Jeff, because it leads to, a, I think, a pretty important question here that we'll, we'll probably spend the rest of our time on, and that's, <clears throat> does collaborative engagement have a positive effect on awareness of broader landscape scale and regional land management concerns? But more importantly, what steps could land managers take to improve collaboration among themselves, stakeholders, and local communities? What could they do to do a better job? So we've done some pretty interesting things, I think, in, in Montana and Idaho around connecting collaboratives yeah. so they can learn from each other's experiences. So there's the Idaho Forest Restoration Partnership, was a which is a network of all the collaboratives in Idaho, mm -hmm. and then the Montana Collaborative Forest Network, which is the same thing in, in Montana. And, and now those two networks yes. are starting to, you'll be there next week, I believe, yeah. facil or co or hosting that meeting. Yep. Um, and so there's a lot to be learned, especially since some collaboratives are much more mature. Some poli local places are really only interested in, they're not interested in maybe a, co a formal collaborative, what we call brick and mortar collaboratives, where you have a charter and 
you know, rules and things like that, but they just want to work together to get a project done just through a collaborative process. And so there's just a lot of lessons and things to be shared um, across all the different collaboratives and their experiences. And one of the things that we try to do is create the space and facilitate that exchange of knowledge and experience. And I think what's really paying off because now they're starting to reach out on their own to each other and say, hey, can you come talk to my collaborative about what you guys did over there? And so, and that's, I've, we found that to be really successful. The, um, uh, kind of as a follow on, and thanks for taking that thread and Christine for that response. Um, you know, we've, we've got a lot of collaboratives in Arizona. We've got the Altar Valley Conservation Li Alliance, which is a, a group of uh, ranchers down in southern Arizona and a large refuge right on the Mexican border with a lot of shared interests in a watershed. The Malpai Borderlands group is uh, a bunch of large landowner ranchers down in the New Mexico boot hill in the far southeastern corner of, of Arizona that recognized that fire was a natural and necessary part and they had an opportunity to band together. There are about 14 large ranches and um, they've been doing that for probably 30 years. Diablo Trust has been around up in northeastern Arizona, been around almost as long. Then we've got some watershed groups, the Upper Verde Watershed Protection uh, Coalition and the Gila Watershed Partnership, but they've all been around at least 25 years. And so I think the longer that they're together, the deeper their understanding, appreciation, and a shared desire for a positive outcome. And all of the issues that were discussed at the previous panel uh, were in, are in play there. Yeah, I guess I would just add that, you know, basically collaboration came about because the general public didn't feel like the Forest Service was listening to a lot of their concerns. So growing up as a kid, my dad always said, you got two ears and one mouth, son, use them in proportion. I think that's very good advice. discussions in the round table, um, the bottom line rule was just mutual respect. And you didn't have to agree with each other, but hear each other out and then focus on what you can agree to move forward with and put the things you disagree on aside. Everybody had a voice in the round table, they still do, um, and everybody's opinion mattered. And I think that that model worked really well. I think we only ever had to ask one person to leave a meeting. In 17 years, that's not bad. Um, I think we'll have time maybe for a question or two, if you've got them. The thing that Bob mentioned, this uh, the collaboratives we have in Idaho, they did that. They decided to begin to share information among themselves, and then Montana came into it. And it really was done by folks working on the ground that just said, we need to get together and talk about what's working and ours versus another one. New ones came to learn from the ones that had been around. That's the neatest thing to me is they did it on their own and it just grew. So do we have any questions from anybody um, for this panel? Finally a question after two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this one's for Bob. So you, in your slide, you talked about Idaho needing to treat like 8.8 .8 million acres, and you're the largest state doing 40,000. So how, since this is partly to give advice to the Western Governors Association, what would you recommend to, to get that, to increase that pace or to actually treat the land? Well, I, you know, the, fr the first thing is fix fire funding and get some forest reform, but we're working on that already. But I, th I think that that's the number one thing that can be done to, uh, I think all the parts and pieces are in place, and I think the trend's going in the right direction. I'm just saying that, you know, it, it really needs a substantial uptick, and, and I think the, you know, we're not, in Idaho, we didn't wait around for federal funding, so that's why GNA do the sales put the money back into the land to recycle that money. And the, the reason I think it was successful in Idaho is that industry put up a million bucks over five years, general fund threw in $250,000 a year, and the Forest Service had some grants of 300 to 350,000 annually to get this thing jump started. And, and I mean, it didn't just happen overnight. We, it, it, it took a couple years of, 
a, lo a lot of work from a lot of people to, to make it all happen, to get it where it is, even now. And it got the attention of Senator Crapo at some point, who became a big sponsor of some of this. And, and he's certainly an, a conservative Republican from Idaho, but he got on board with this. I just, from a Forest Service perspective, who um, I wouldn't say that we're challenged with NEPA, the way we implement NEPA, um, I think the four fry example in Arizona is one of the more successful large landscape looks at NEPA. But for us to be more successful in treating a greater proportion of the landscape, we need to get our, get our way out of our NEPA conundrum, which we're focusing an enormous amount of effort on right now. And I'm actually pretty optimistic that we're going to see some, some changes here that are really going to result in moving the needle more than it has in the last five to ten years. Anybody else have a question at all? Okay, so in a, in a minute we'll thank our panelists. We'll have a break until 3.15, so try to be as timely as possible so we could get the next panel.